Well, my name's Dr. Bobby Jones. Um, I'm a, about a native. I came here in 55 when my dad started his practice here. My father was from Boiling Springs, Earl Scroves country, and my mom was from Waco. Uh, so we've been here since 1955, and uh, except for going off to school. And uh, I've been involved in music pretty much the whole way. Uh, I think my parents were scared I was gonna become a Beatle. But uh, really, I wanted to be Bill Monroe, but that didn't work out either. <laughs> no, I, I really got interested in bluegrass later, actually, in medical school from a guy named Dr. Peter Temple. And I sort of switched from rock and roll to bluegrass then. Been doing that ever since. And uh, how'd you get into medicine? Well, my dad was a doctor, and, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, almost a way of life. We, we thought that's what everybody did when we were growing up. Uh, and he made house calls, and the whole nine yards treated all my friends. and. Half the time, they, it, medicine's really changed. I mean, they come over to the house for a camp physical on Sunday night or something, you know. So it was just something that we thought everybody did. Um, I love ball and I love music. And my, my mother uh, thought I was better with books and put me in a speed reading course. And, uh, and I, I quick found out she was right. I was better with books and the other things and continued on in that. Dick Hamrick had a lot to do with it. I was, uh, when I was in high school, I guess, uh, when I met Dick Hamrick, I was probably interested in girls and guitars and golf, and that was about it. But uh, Dick was a famous uh, chemistry teacher around here. And uh, he, he pulled me aside in the beginning and said, you know, I know you think you're smart, but if you don't study for my class, you'll make an F. And I thought, well, I've never made an F. I can't do that. So I actually studied, and then the next thing I knew, it was pretty cool to make A's in chemistry, and that, that led me all the way to medicine, really. That and my dad, yeah. Well, what are your earliest memories of Shelby and Cleveland County? Just from a cultural scene, what do you remember about it? Oh gosh, earliest memories? Uh, well, my, my grandmother had a farm out at Waco and uh, I'd go out there and uh, spend the weekend and watch the Miss America pageant and eat post toasties, I remember that, and uh, <laughs> had a little pony named Roscoe and I thought I was gonna be, I also thought I was gonna be in the Kentucky Derby, that didn't work out either. Uh, and uh, one of my earliest memories of Shelby actually is uh, whenever we would go off, which wasn't very often because Dad worked all the time back in those days, there was a sign that said, uh, uh, you, you'd come back around a curve and there was a sign that said, uh, uh, welcome to Shelby, the city of pleasant living if it's fresher than Boston, it's still in the oven. And every time I saw that sign, I knew I was back home. <laughs> so I did a lot of things. I picked a little cotton, uh, but just enough to find out I need to be a doctor, you know. Yeah, the cotton culture here has dominated most of these conversations mm -hmm. this week. Um, just a huge way of life and, and obviously a, a, an economic stake that has dwindled over the last 50 years, but not calamitously. It's been mm -hmm. slow. Um, mm -hmm. Any reflections on that, the mills, the textiles, and watching a, you know, uh, 50 years of, of um, the evolution of that and the, and the county reacting? Well, you know, some of the old mill life is gone. I remember when I first came to town, they still had jam sessions over on Lily Mill Hill, and we'd go over there and play. And some of those guys are professional bluegrass musicians now. And uh, and that bypass has been cut through there now, so a lot of that, that territory is gone. Uh, but I think uh, I'm, I'm not a visionary kind of guy. I'm more of a uh, go to work every day and ask people where their belly hurts, you know, and that's how I spent my whole life. But uh, I think people like Brownie and people of, of vision uh, are, are moving our economy to... Uh, to, to other things than, than strictly and solely a farm and uh, a mill community, you know. I mean, when I was growing up, most everybody worked, um, it seemed to me, they were either a farmer uh, uh, or a teacher or worked at the mill or, um, or, or a doctor, you know, like my dad. It seemed like everybody had just three or four things. I know there were other things, but that's the way it seemed as a kid. Um, I remember when PPG came to town, I think it was 58 or 9, it was a big thing in the paper. It was huge. We never had a big factory like that to come. I remember how, how what a what a big thing it was to get that in. And we're moving back to that now. We're having other industries come in now. And Brian could tell you a lot more about that. Now, I can tell you about writing prescriptions and playing the mandolin. I'm afraid that's about it. <laughs> well, how did you get started in music and what was going on in the area that made it, that, that encouraged you? Well, uh, of course, I came up uh, playing uh, in the band and that sort of thing. There was a guy in town named Ray Ledford, and I guess every human being that's come through here that learned to play learned something from Ray. And Ray, to us, was just, uh, and he is a genius. He's a music genius. And, and so we all looked to Ray and tried to get a few lessons from Ray. And uh, uh, so that had a lot to do with it. The Beatles, you know, everybody was, I think they'd probably tell you at Shelby Music Center, the, the Beatles had more to do with reviving the guitar industry than anything that ever came along. 
Um, and again, I played, and I played in the local combos and that kind of thing for uh, school dances and whatever. Played mostly guitar back in those days. Uh, there was a guy named Scott uh, Scott McSwain and Steve Trell, and I played over at the old junior high school, and I'm sure we were just perfectly horrible. I wish I had a tape of it, but uh, uh, then uh, when I went off to college, I didn't, you know, I didn't really play as much, and I didn't play as much in med school either. But somewhere towards the end of med school, I, I just uh, wasn't able to give it up, and. Uh, met Peter Temple. Peter was the first guy to show me that you could be a doctor and play music too. He, that was what he did, so he was my guru in that. Started playing again uh, with Peter. John Starlin too. Well, yeah, I, yeah John Starlin uh, probably done it better than anybody, hadn't he? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he hangs out with Linda Ronstadt and I hang out with Bluegrass Boys, you know. <laughs> Why, when did you get interested in traditional music and was traditional, was, was, was string band or bluegrass music any part of your youth? Did you do your no, surprisingly to people, it wasn't that much. I mean, I watched the Beverly the Hillbillies like everybody else, and I liked Flat and Scrubs like everybody else, but I didn't really play that much of that kind of music. When I was in high school, it wasn't considered all that hip, really, to, to be playing that music. Um, so, uh, but, but, it, but the first time I heard Earl, though, I thought that was extremely special. I really did. And, and I had a longing to play the banjo. And after I met Peter, I actually got into the banjo for a while there and uh, played that pretty heavy for uh, four or five years. Uh, right around the end of, uh, well, be beginning of residency, I guess, when I really got started on the banjo, yeah. So I actually uh, played, we had an all-doctor bluegrass band. I was the banjo player for um, Sawbones Grass, and we even played the uh, Tennessee Amphitheater one time years ago, so it was a lot of fun. I still know those guys out there. Well, what, tell me more about the Lily Mill Hill jam sessions, because we've got Earl talking about working at Lily Mill and reports of uh, musicians and well back into the 20s right. and 30s, mill workers playing together right. on breaks and stuff. Right. Yeah, well, th th I was led to that uh, s those sessions by a guy named Ray Allison that I used to play some with in New River, and uh, uh, there was a guy, a guy in town named Keith Fortenberry, and, and those guys would, uh, you know, I just, they were just jam sessions. I didn't know there was, I didn't realize how special they were until they were gone. <laughs> I, di I didn't play a lot of them. It's right when I first came to town, around um, 84, 5, and 6, somewhere along in there. And there was one of those guys, and uh, Jeff, uh, I'm blocking on his name now, but Jeff is now uh, uh, plays professionally. I think he lives up around Morganton now. But he was just a little kid running in and out of the, out of the place. He grew up with it. And he didn't know that everybody, didn't, just like I didn't know that everybody wanted a doctor, he didn't know everybody couldn't play music. That's what he did. And what's your take on, on uh, Earl Scruggs and, and bluegrass music and how so much of it uh, came out of this area? Because one of the things we were struck by Patrick Huber's book, Windhead Stomp, kind of con almost confirms this theory that some bluegrass and country music scholars have had that, you know, that the mountains have been the mythical place, birthplace of country music, but that really a lot of it was this semi-industrial mm -hmm. Piedmont. And what do you, what do you know about that? How much money do you think? Well, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, some people think it's in the water, and some geology professor that was convinced it was in the Flint Hill rocks and came up here and chopped up a bunch of them and took them back to study him, but you know, all those are just myths. I, I, I think that Earl was a genius, actually. I, I think that he was just one of those uh, once in a lifetime geniuses that, uh, and they had uh, a fair amount of time. They worked awfully hard, but I've heard him and Horace talk about, um, you know, they'd work awfully hard, but if it rained, they'd sit and play all day long. They didn't have television, and they'd listen to the Grand Ole Opry on the radio, but they didn't have a lot of distraction. And I remember the day, uh, or I, I don't remember the day, I remember Horace telling about the day that they had gotten in some kind of uh, disagreement about something, I, you know, they'd long since forgotten what, and uh, they'd gone to their separate rooms, and uh, and Earl came down the hall and said, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, and uh, he said, what have you got, what have you got, and he said, listen to this, and it was Reuben with three fingers, and that was the first time that Horace, at least, remembered uh, that particular, the evolution of that particular style. I think probably it's true there were a couple other people working on that and kind of getting some of that going. I don't think many people would argue that uh, Earl was the one that embellished it and perfected it to the point that it belonged on the Grand Ole Opry. So, but as far as why it was him, I, I don't know. I, you know, I think it's hard to know why somebody's a genius. And um, the area is also, I mean, Charlie Poole's from not too far from here, Don Gibson's from here. There's mm -hmm. a lot of hillbilly music that right. was made here. What do you, what, what in your studies have you learned about the area as a cultivator music. Well, you know, I don't know a lot. When I came along, uh, for me, music was a way to relax from the uh, stresses of 
being a doctor, which aren't too bad. It's not as bad as picking cotton. But um, I would, uh, that, that, that's what I did to relax. And we had a little social group, and that's what we did. We'd find out who was playing where. And, we, and I think that they, when they were growing up on the farm, that's what they did. You know, they, they got together to play music. So uh, I guess that's been going on a long time around here. Do you think of Cleveland County or the Piedmont as an especially musical area? It seems to be, doesn't it? I mean, you know, a lot of good people have come out of here. Now, why? I'm going to have to leave that to you scholars. I don't know. <laughs> but it does seem that way, yes. So you mentioned Horace and that you're very impressed by him. Tell, oh, yeah. tell us about Horace. He was good. The way I met Horace um, was uh, when I came back to town, I kind of, I'd, I'd gotten pretty far along in my playing, but I was actually still um, pretty much an amateur player. And still am, but but at that stage I was just developing, and uh, so uh, I wanted to go to the source if I could, and I asked my dad if uh, he could get me up with Horace to, to play, and um, and uh, Dad had gone to a, a high school with Earl back in the day and knew Horace and all that. They all they all knew. As Horace said, he knew everybody in Bowling Springs before it grew up so big, you know. But uh, at any rate, Dad talked to Horace, and next thing I know, I was over at his house playing and. And uh, we became great friends. I didn't really anticipate at the time. I just tried to learn something about playing, but we, we became really close friends. Horace was a very uh, loyal, reliable human being. I guess my favorite story about Horace, uh, he came by the office about something one time and I was in a dither because my wife had called and she had a new stove and it wasn't working and I was gonna have to try to find somebody and get things done and whatever. And he heard all this and like Horace always did, he didn't say anything. He just went by my house and fixed it all. And I, and I forgot about it, actually. I got tied up in other doctor things and forgot about it, got home, and there supper was on the stove, and Horace was the one that <laughs> had wired it up and ready to go. And those boys came up in the country. They knew everything. Horace, knew, Horace could uh, set pecan trees. They'd use dynamite to blow up a big hole and set a pecan tree, and he could refinish furniture and rebuild cars and build his own house. Horace built virtually all of his house by himself with, with the help of a few friends, you know, when you need somebody to hold something up or whatever. Horace was, uh, they, these guys were country geniuses, really. They were the kind of people that uh, grew up on a farm, and if they didn't get it done, if they didn't know how to do it themselves, it didn't get done. And so Horace and I rode out a lot of places together, little shows when we played with, uh, Horace played in every band that I played in as a rhythm guitar man, and, uh, and really, uh, hmm. Well, what has it been like uh, playing in a variety of bands, meeting a variety of musicians from the area, and um, uh, just paint a picture of me, uh, paint a picture for me of the contemporary musical life around you? The last thing I wanted to tell you about Horace is that right side of that stage has been mighty empty since he's gone. The, you know. But uh, well, you know, I think the uh, musicians. I would say that as far as really fairly serious string musicians right around here in my immediate circle. There's some 25 to 50 of them, and they're virtually like musical chairs, interchangeable. Now, there are some that have gone to a different level, like Darren Brooke. I mean, Darren does this for a living, and he does it all day, every day. He was good to start with, and he's very good now, and so is Brooke. But, but short of that level, most of us are fairly serious amateurs, and, and, and we feel in and try to help each other. If somebody calls me and is going to play at church, and I'm free, I'll go play. Unfortunately, my schedule is such I can't do everything I'd like to do. But uh, and I think they're all that way, you know. So you'll you'll see these bands mix and match a lot, you know. And thought, I thought you were playing with so and so, and it's confusing to everybody. To us, it's not very confusing. I re but I'm reminded of a story. Uh, Peter Temple, my old mentor, went out to Oklahoma City uh, to. Uh, uh, it was some fundraiser for the local symphony, and a guy named well, you know, Alan Mundy. Alan Mundy was there playing as. Uh, uh, and uh, so Peter decided to sit in, and the lady, uh, one of the ladies said, I, I don't understand how you can do this. You guys don't even know each other. You don't have any music in front of you, and, you're, and yet you know all these songs. How are you doing this? And, and uh, Monday said, well, ma'am, I reckon it's just the international language of music. <laughs> I never got that. <laughs> so we, we sort of have the international language of music going on, uh, to the point that maybe we don't get everything else done that we should. Uh, uh, socially or economically or a lot of other things, you know, I've had to rely on people like Brownie to do that for sometimes. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the bomb shelter, which I think was actually a venue. Yeah, the bomb shelter is an interesting place. Uh, the bomb shelter is, uh, I don't I don't, I don't guess he minds me telling, but uh, Jack Bingham is a retired uh, barber who uh, owns the bomb shelter. It's a 
pre-war bomb shelter. That's what it is uh, down around Cherville. And uh, the old saying is you can't get there from here. It's hard to get to. But um, it's a place where, uh, I mean, people like Charlie Waller have been through there and Doc Watson and Newgrass Revival and all kinds of people. But it's not for show. They just, when they're drifting through, sometimes they'll come over there and jam, you know. Uh, I guess my favorite, and Darren, a lot of Darren's development was at the bomb shelter late at night. But um, one time I, when Flint Hill was playing, we were opening for uh, Larry Sparks down at um, Old Perry's Auction Barn down near Statesville. I don't know if you ever played a show down there, but uh, somebody uh, came up and said, um, "There's some folks in from England, and they're going to uh, they're going to Merlefest next week, and they want to know where to find some good music before they get to Merlefest." And uh, so somebody pointed me out. I said, "Go go ask that guy; he'll be able to tell you." I said, "Well, I'll invite you to the bomb shelter." They didn't know what it was, of course. And I met them over at the, the Hampton, I believe it was, here in town. I'm sure it was the Hampton. And, uh, and drove them to the bomb shelter because there was no way to give them directions, you know. And as it so would happen, Charlie Waller was there that night uh, because I think, the, I think the country gentlemen were going to be up at Merlefest, I think. But anyway, Charlie was there and Darren was there and a lot of really good pickers were there. And they were, they said, you do this every night. And we had to admit that wasn't always the crowd that was there, you know, but they really enjoyed that. In fact, they emailed me and said they had more fun there than they did at Merle Fest, you know, because it was up close and personal. So it was just a private space. And it's a private you know, space. A yeah, house. yeah, it's like a it's like a clubhouse. That's exactly what it's like. Yeah, it's, it's for a bunch of overgrown boys. Yeah, that's it. and girls too. Yeah. That's neat. So tell me about some of the uh, the actual venues in the area that have been important. Well, of in course, any, in any genre. yeah. Uh, well, there, there are a lot of them. Of course, the, the, the granddad of them now is, is the Scruggs Theater, of course, you know, and pretty soon the Earl Museum. I mean, that's that's going to be the ticket, you know. I mean, that's that's where the, the big guns are going to play. Uh, short of that, uh, people like Steve Leatherwood had a venue for years, still runs the radio station down at Garden Web, or not runs, but DJs the radio station down at Garden Web. And he had a regular venue every every Saturday night for a long time. And the first time I played, there were five. I was one of the guys in the band. There were five in the band, five in the audience. <laughs> uh, but it grew from there. And he still does it up in Falston, but only once a month now. So there's there, and, and there's a lot of music played at the churches around, and um, a lot of private parties. I, one time I played a wedding, and a little girl uh, uh, emailed me after the wedding and and, uh, and thanked me for being a part of her important day I thought good gracious to be on her radar about her wedding you know when we just down there picking some music is pretty amazing so we, we've gotten woven in the fabric pretty good I guess yeah, I read about Leather Woods was it in a specific location or yeah it was just place? one light and turn right and uh, uh, just before you get to Shelby Cameron video I, I think the building has been sold now and it's something else but anyway it was a great venue for a good solid decade I guess when did Liquor by the Drink come in? Because that would have affected 91. Not just 91, which would have really had an uh, effect on the club life in the 80s, I guess. Yeah. Was there a club life? In You're asking the wrong guy on that one. I mean, my idea of a great night, and I, and I really mean this, uh, like go down to Max McKee's, you know, the bluegrass uh, in number two and jam a session on the, on the stage with Max. So as far as, I really can't answer. I don't know. I mean, uh, my social life has revolved around my wife and my children and my music. And so if there is, somebody else is going to have to answer that for you. I don't know. All right, uh, guys, and what do you think of our conversation return here? We, we were in Leatherwood yesterday with Millie and Larry Corey and Linda. Oh, it's changed completely. That's Leatherwood Place, and it was the, bake, the bakery there. Oh, wow. We shot from there yesterday. Fantastic. In the side, yeah. All right, on the square. There were a lot of good people. Oh, Leatherwoods was big. Lost and Found came through there. Dempsey Young was there, you know, right not too long before he died. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of good people coming through there. Absolutely. Just being in the orbit of Charlotte, has that changed the music, has that affected the music scene here, or, or maybe hurt it in the sense that people would go play there and not here? Well, I, I don't think it's hurt us any. There, there are some pretty good people down in Charlotte. The Charlotte Folk Music Society is active. The, uh, um, oh, the... Um, I'm trying to. What's what's the name of the venue that the, the gentleman has? Um, I'm blocking on it all of a sudden. Um, I'll think of it when the interview is over. But anyway, they 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 they've got a pretty active uh, folk music scene. We've gone down there and played some gigs. They ladder at the ladder plantation and various places. So uh, I can't tell they've heard us any. You know, they they've recruited us to come play some. Do you think 
the younger people in, growing up in Shelby know about Earl Scruggs and bluegrass music? And you, do you know if there's, what do you think it takes to pass that knowledge and enthusiasm on? Well, if they're my patients, they know. I can tell you that. <laughs> That's for sure. But, uh, you know, I, I do think they know. I don't, uh, when I was growing up, man, Earl was, uh, well, I, there was an old story about Brooks Piercy that went went out to uh, Nashville, and everybody was really, lo I mean, incredibly loyal to Earl, and, and should be, you know. And anyway, Brooks supposedly went to the front, and, and Earl told him to come, and we'll get you into the backstage at the opera or something. I don't, I don't know the details of the story, but anyway, Brooks was a very well-known um, agriculture teacher down here that lived to was about 95 or 6, I think, and taught everybody, his brother, including Earl. And at any rate, he got, and they said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, tell him Brooks Piercy is here and just ask him. And they came back and said, Mr. Piercy, come right, come right in, you know. And so the culture around here when I was growing up was that Earl was just flat famous, but still hadn't gotten above his raising, you know. And, uh, and so I, I, I kind of like that in a celebrity type person. In other words, uh, Earl, Earl's famous. He reinvented the banjo and yet he uh, doesn't act like he's better than everybody else, you know. And so uh, I hope that our kids uh, don't, I, my children certainly won't. Uh, we used to go out to school and take our instruments. And my son played one time at the junior high and everybody, at first they just looked at us like, what are you doing? You know, my boy got out the banjo and played uh, Foggy Mountain Breakdown and he got about two bars into it and everybody started clapping and screaming, you know, and they never forgot it actually. They, they still remember him as the kid that came and played Foggy Mountain uh, Breakdown on the banjo. And uh, so I, I think we're keeping it going, but I think we need to keep it going. And obviously the uh, Earl Scruggs uh, Center and the, and the Gibson, these are important things to keep it going. With those going, I don't see how they're going to forget.